Can I Kick It by A Tribe Called Quest was the third single off their debut album in 1990. It was a big hit then and has stayed fresh in the years since. For instance, it was just in the movie Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem from last year. This is an absolute classic and Tribe has made zero dollars from it. Today we're talking all about the classic song Can I Kick It by A Tribe Called Quest, why they've never made a dime from it, but with that, the strange story of the betrayed rock star who took 100% of this song, and why it's a perfect encapsulation of everything wrong with the music industry. To start, let's jump right into why Tribe made zero dollars from this song. There are multiple samples on this song, including drums from Spinning Wheel by Lonnie Smith. That right there. There's another organ part sampled in this song as well. There are a couple others too, a horn stab from Sly and the Family Stone, a guitar slide from another record, but the other big sample is Walk on the Wild Side by Lou Reed from 1972. This is how the Tribe song starts, and this bass line loops throughout. Of course, there's drums and all the samples I just mentioned, the scratching and verses from Q-Tip and Fife. So you might think, oh, that's a lot of samples. That was probably expensive to clear. That's why Tribe never made money on this. And that's almost it, except it's even simpler than that. Lou Reed specifically agreed to clear the sample, but under one condition he would get 100% of the publishing and royalties. You see, sample clearance is the Wild West. If you didn't get a sample cleared and you don't get caught, no problem. But if you do get caught, you could get sued. So why not just clear the sample? Well, that's because by US law, there is no standard fee or percentage for sample clearance. You have to contact each individual copyright holder and negotiate on a song by song basis. And the copyright holder has all of the power. They can straight up deny the clearance and you can't release the song at all, or they can ask for whatever percentage of the song they want. This is why people don't clear samples. There's a risk that your song will get shut down, or in the case of Can I Kick It, you just get no money at all. Lou Reed could have denied the sample clearance, but instead he cleared it and then took 100%. Now, that's dumb to me for a few reasons. For one, there are other samples in Can I Kick It. There's scratching and then there's rhymes on top of it all. This is a different song. I completely understand wanting to get paid when someone samples your music, but 100%? You don't actually want this song to exist. Or rather, I guess you just want to punish the group for sampling you. And what's crazy is I kept digging, and there's a lot more to Lou Reed's history with hip hop than just this song. This story goes back years before this tribe song and paints an interesting picture. One that just might explain why he did this to a Tribe Called Quest. The year is 1984. A completely different hip hop group, Run DMC, had just released their self-titled debut album. It had several hit singles and the group was growing in popularity. In September of that same year, 1984, Lou Reed picked Run DMC to open for him at a concert, which was taped and aired on MTV's show, Rock Influences. Lou Reed was in the Velvet Underground in the 60s, had a solo career after that, which is the era Walk on the Wild Side is from, it's 1972, and he is a legend. He liked Run DMC because he saw a little bit of himself in them. As he explained, I respect Run DMC because when they came out, they reminded me of me when I was a young musician in my garage, beating on pots and pans to everyone's music. That could be read as condescending, but there's something really nice about that. Even though they make different music, Lou Reed sees enough of himself in Run DMC that he invites them to share the stage with him, introducing them to his audience. The only problem was Lou Reed's mostly white rock fan audience didn't know what to do with Run DMC. As Daryl DMC McDaniels explained, From the 20 minute set that we had, I would say 20% of the crowd was booing. I'm talking boo, middle fingers up, boo, boo, boo. Once the boo started, we was about to walk off stage, but then we thought we'd just try to have some fun with it. It was very miserable being up there. 
We finish the show dejected. Lou Reed takes the stage and says, before I start my show, I would like to address all you people who was booing. Then he goes into this dialogue about, you booing these guys, you might as well boo me. Because outside of all these Hollywood pop disco people, whatever, I see myself as them. That is fantastic. Lou Reed not only asks Run DMC to open for him, he scolds his audience for booing. Lou Reed is standing up for them, standing up for hip hop, trying to show the rock crowd that there's something here for them too. It would appear that Lou Reed liked hip hop because not only was there this Run DMC show from 1984, but two years later, in April of 1986, he released the song, The Original Rapper. The music of the song doesn't feel very hip hop. It feels very rock, very Lou Reed, but he's definitely doing something like rapping on top. And yeah, it's rapper with a W, and the lyric is, make sure your candy is in the original rapper. But there's another lyric, hip hop gonna bop till I drop. Lou Reed is well aware that he's basically rapping, but combined with rock music. It's completely intentional. In the same way that he stood up for Run DMC two years prior at his own show, He's trying now to combine hip hop and rock. So I, I just wonder how Lou Reed felt when three months after the release of this song, Run DMC released Walk This Way with Aerosmith. Walk This Way was originally released by Aerosmith in 1975, but this new version from 1986, rather than sampling, was made in collaboration with Run DMC, with Steven Tyler and Joe Perry re-recording the vocals and guitars respectively. This song was not only a huge hit for Run DMC, it was a huge comeback for Aerosmith, and obviously it's combining hip hop with rock. Now, I don't know how Lou Reed felt about this. There's no interview, no quote, no official response. But I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say he probably didn't love this song. Lou Reed is a rock legend. Velvet Underground in the 60s, incredibly influential. Solo career throughout the 70s, and he likes hip hop. He's rapping on his own song, combining rock and rap together. In 84, he's sticking his neck out for hip hop and specifically run DMC. And this is how they thank him? By teaming up with different rock legends and releasing a huge rap rock hit? Again, I don't know this for sure, but this just feels like human nature. So hold that in your mind. Lou Reed maybe feels betrayed by Run DMC a little bit. He wanted to bring rock and hip hop together, but they go and collaborate with Aerosmith for Walk This Way. Then, fast forward four years later, it's 1990, and these new kids, Tribe Called Quest, sampled his song from the 70s. They didn't collaborate with him, didn't ask him to re-record part of the song. They're not trying to bring him into the project. They just want the sample cleared. Sure, this is speculation, but I submit this is why Lou Reed cleared it and took 100% of the royalties. He felt betrayed and wished he'd been invited to collaborate instead of just being sampled. Even the name of the song, Walk on the Wild Side, is close to Walk This Way, the name of the Run DMC betrayal song. But here's the thing with all of this. The sample in question, the brief part of Walk on the Wild Side that's in Can I Kick It, it's the bass line. And Lou Reed did not come up with that. This iconic bass line was played by session bassist Herbie Flowers. It's actually two simultaneous bass lines, a combination of an upright bass and an electric bass, one ascending and one descending. This song at its core is just a one to four chord progression. It's very simple. The defining characteristic of this song, the sample worthy part, is the bass line. As Herbie Flowers explained, I thought, can I do it on this? Because the song itself is dark. It, it seemed to work doing. And being an old jazz, I thought, oh, can I try something? Yeah, of course you can. And I overdubbed the bass guitar a tenth. That's 10 notes above what the double bass was doing and it is quite a distinctive sound sounds stupid doesn't it but when you combine that with the other bass it takes on another character
that's what you created. Well, yeah, but that's what old jazzers do. You, you put bits in. Herbie Flowers was a session bassist who just happened to come up with this iconic line. And yes, he was paid double because it's technically two lines, but he says he was paid a total of 17 pounds, which is about 150 US dollars in today's money. He didn't receive songwriting credit or any royalties, so when this song blew up and then was sampled by Tribe, he made no additional money. The only one coming out on top here is Lou Reed. And this is why I said at the beginning that this is a perfect encapsulation of everything wrong with the music industry. There is so much creativity going around, from Herbie Flowers' bass line to Lou Reed's song, to samples like Can I Kick It by A Tribe Called Quest. And the only one making money off this is Lou Reed. We need better systems in place for session musicians, for producers who want to sample. It's in need of a serious overhaul, but that solution is not gonna be in this video. In this case, Herbie Flowers got his 150 bucks and Tribe got another big single after I left my wallet in El Segundo and Bonita Applebum, which are also on this album. But fortunately, this Lou Reed sample fiasco didn't scare away Q-Tip or a track called Quest. After this, they went back into the studio, raising the bar on their production, not only on their next album, The Low End Theory, but also the one after that, Midnight Marauders. I got to speak with engineer Bob Power about the creation of that album, and it's in this video right here. Tap here to watch it. <laughs> 